Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you fine folk around the world. Today, we're continuing with our series on Ancient Egypt, with the details of the First Intermediary Period and the Middle Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. So, last time we left off, the Old Kingdom had just splintered into multiple little governorates, each controlled by a local governor, after the collapse of central government in the Old Kingdom. And you're probably expecting a great big collapse where everything falls apart. Cities are abandoned, empires fall, outposts are just left to rot, and fields left untended for archaeologists to one day find. But no. No, not with Egypt, not this time. For you see, these local governorates eventually reunited into the two separate kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt. So, things aren't exactly back to Golden Age territory yet for Egypt, but could be worse. You could be the Sumerian regions, who at this point in history were... Ooh... Ouch, okay, they were going through a bit of a dark age at the time. That sounds fun, I guess. Oh dear god, yeah, we're gonna have to get onto that at some point. Anyway though, you may think that Upper and Lower Egypt as two separate kingdoms were at least allies or had close contact. Nope, wrong again, Sonny Jim. Instead, two separate cities led the two separate kingdoms. Hierakonpolis led Lower Egypt, whereas Thebes led Upper Egypt. You can probably tell who the victor of the two was who managed to reunite Egypt in the end, because of course Thebes is a much more recognisable name to us these days than Hierakonpolis. And you know the old saying, history is often written by the victors. So, with a bit more detail on the separate kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt, it's interesting to know that both had kings. Both of them had their own royal bloodlines, their own separate dynasties, and intermittently fought with each other. Just like a pair of squabbling siblings left in the same room with the door locked, and there's only enough food for one of them. And guess what? There's no takeaway menus in there either. But anyway, Eventually somebody with a level head would come along. Well, sort of. I mean, he did kind of uh, go on a bit of a conquest rampage, but uh, anyway. So, for roughly 150 years, Upper and Lower Egypt remained as two separate kingdoms and would not stop fighting each other. Until a certain king of the Thebes-led Upper Egypt, known as Mentuhotep II, united the two kingdoms back into a unified Egypt, under the rule of the city of Thebes, circa 2040 BC. And this is where things finally start to get back on track, and with Mentuhotep II of Thebes, we have the birth of the Middle Kingdom. At last! After over a century of warfare and division, we finally have a united Egypt once more. And to be honest, if you compare it with the other civilizations we've covered, at this rough time, Egypt is actually faring better than all of them. I mean, let's look at things here. 2040 BC. The Akkadian Empire had recently collapsed into a Dark Age, the Indus River Valley civilization was no more, the Xia Dynasty of China was not far from being overthrown, and Norte Chico had just been abandoned. So out of all the first civilizations, Egypt rolled a double this time. This time, that is. So, without further ado, let's go on to the Middle Kingdom how it fared, and how Egypt eventually made the leap from Middle Kingdom to the much more well-known New Kingdom of Egypt. So before we delve into the bigger picture, we first have to look at the nitty gritty. Let's first look at a key difference between the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom of Ancient Egypt. So, during the time of the Old Kingdom, it was said that the King of Egypt had absolute power over his territory, subjects, and nobility. However, of course, as we know, towards the end of the Old Kingdom, centralised power with the King began to decline, and of course, that led to the splintering of the governorates of Egypt. And whilst it is true that 
the reign of Menturotep II managed to preserve some of the ways of the Old Kingdom. One aspect that actually led to the Old Kingdom's collapse, in fact, helped to strengthen the government of the Middle Kingdom. For you see, the system of local governorates acting kind of as semi-kings over their territories in their own right, in fact continued in the Middle Kingdom, and was seen as a very effective way to govern. Almost like a laissez-faire approach, but not quite. So of course, the king, in this case Mentuhotep II, ruled above all the governorates, with the semi-kings of the governorates, or nomarchs, acting as localised figureheads, centres of government for more localised territory, meaning that the law, word and command of the king could be more easily and effectively managed over a wider expanse of territory. And in these days of the early kingdoms and empires, it has to be noted that without some kind of infrastructure such as a highly maintained network of roads or a river available, if you have a patch of territory that say way out in the middle of the desert and you have your centre of power in Egypt itself, you are going to lose contact with that outpost fairly quickly. Because Egypt was centred and clustered so much around the River Nile itself, it was much simpler and easier to maintain contact with all these governorates and nomarchs and in order to carry out the king's word no matter the distance. Therefore, the Nile not only acted as a key transport network for not only minerals and nutrients for crops and agriculture, not only for culture, ideas and technology to spread up and down the Nile Highway, but also governance and the rule of law. So you could say that internally, for the Middle Kingdom, things were coming up roses. And so with your home base secure and under control, you would now have the resources available to expand external branches of influence, such as trade, commerce, diplomacy, and if need be, go on a bit of a conquest run. So with the death of Mentuhotep II comes his successor, Mentuhotep III, and it's with him that external expeditions get kicked up a notch. For you see, the land of Punt, far to the south of Egypt, would one day become a great source of trade for the ancient Egyptians, bringing new commodities such as frankincense and myrrh, of which you may be familiar with. And this kind of expedition just shows off the confidence that Mentuhotep III must have had in his government's administration. For you see, this expedition went all the way to modern day Somalia or the Horn of Africa. And seeing as the boundaries of ancient Egypt at this time stretched only into northern Sudan by our modern standards, the fact that the expeditionary force crossed the desert and went all the way to the Horn of Africa is immense. And it shows that Mentuhotep III must have been so confident in his government's administrative capabilities at home that he could send out expeditionary forces to seek new trade and expand the influence of Egypt. So either he was really comfortable in his position, or like some of us today, he saw the world and wanted to know more. Maybe. Maybe. Do not take my word for that. It's after Mentuhotep III that we get Mentuhotep IV. Wait, really? Egypt? Some originality with the names, please. It's a bit of a puzzle, the reign of Mentuhotep IV, because with regards to records of his reign and his accomplishments, the data is strangely silent. All we know is that Mentuhotep IV reigned for six years between 1997 BC and 1991 BC. But apart from that, we know next to nothing. It may be because the kings and pharaohs of Egypt had the awful habit of sometimes going back and wiping the records and destroying any mention of their predecessor's name, which is a bit of a pain in the backside for us who study history uh, because it means there's no evidence. No writing, 
and nothing to go off of. Yeah, well done for feeding your ego, but can you at least just try to make this easier, please? Well, it's about to be made slightly easier, because after Menturotep the fourth, we have Amenemhat the first, and this king wasted no time. In fact, in 1990 BC, Amenemhat I was said to have introduced the first standing army to Egypt, meaning that in case of an invasion or internal strife, Egypt had a backbone and therefore a backup plan if any kind of trade or diplomacy failed or was under threat, meaning that through this succession of four kings of ancient Egypt, the country was secure and stable, with a strong hand in leadership, a strong administrative network of government, and secure borders held up by a great army. And with security and stability in any country at any point in history comes internal expansion, not just with internal trade and the general output of a country's economy, but also with the aspects that give human civilization its breath of life in that of culture, of the arts, literature, philosophy, and architecture. In the internal growth of the country, it seems Mentuhotep II also wasted no time in ushering in a golden age for Egypt, for he is known to have built a mortuary complex at Deir el Bahri, which is said to have influenced even the architects of the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt during the New Kingdom, meaning that despite the intermediary periods between each of the three kingdoms, one kingdom's ability to influence its descendants' development and progress was never shattered, and just acts as a testament to the strength of the continuity of ancient Egypt throughout its history. It's with Amenemhat I that the 12th dynasty of ancient Egypt begins, and is credited as being one of the strongest dynasties of ancient Egypt's history, contributing to much growth not only externally, but also internally with culture, the arts and literature, as well as architecture. With literature in particular, we get an interesting piece of writing that is a bit bold in its statements surrounding Amenemhat I. It is known as the Prophecy of Neferti, which itself claims to have been written before the time of Amenemhat I, but our methods put it as being written after his reign, but anyway. The prophecy of Nefertiti claims to have predicted the coming of a king from the south, Ameni, the justified by name, who will rule over a united Egypt and smite all his enemies. As you can see, just a bit bold. However, I suppose we can forgive the prophecy of Nefertiti for being a bit bold in its description of Amenemhat I. For instance, he is said to have moved his court from the capital of Thebes in Upper Egypt instead to a place known as Ititawi, just south of the old capital of Memphis. Given the distance between Thebes and Memphis themselves, you can either say that Amenemhat I either had some serious muscle power going on, or things were pretty damn stable for the Middle Kingdom at the time. And to be honest, Amenemhat's confidence in his own kingdom is not misplaced even in the slightest, for the Middle Kingdom in the modern era is said to be known as the beginning of Egypt's classical age, where literature, art, architecture and culture were at their heights, and you can only know these kind of heights if you have a strong and stable form of government and administration. How did Eminem Hat the first achieve this? Well, it was by entrusting certain positions with varying degrees of power, such as that of the nomarchs, only to those either within his family or those he could trust. And this is probably where his confidence in his own regime came from. But with the death of Amenem Hat the first, that glory train was rolling and nothing could stop it. So now, 
we come on to Amenemhat I's successor, Senusret I, who continued many of Amenemhat's policies and is also famous for beginning the construction of the temple complex at Karnak, dedicated to the god Amun, which is still standing to this day and serves as an excellent reminder of the legacy that the ancient Egyptians left on the world for us. I mean, look at it! Seriously, take a look at all of this! For such an early civilization to have built complexes such as Karnak, it's incredible! And after over 3,000 years, think of all the events that have happened in all that time. It's lived through it all. And I mean, you could even catch a flight to Egypt, go over there and have a look at it for yourself if you really wanted to. And it's interesting to see that even art takes on a new form under the Middle Kingdom. For you see, during the Old Kingdom, inscriptions, paintings and sculptures were mainly theological in nature, so built to honour the gods and deities. But it's under the Middle Kingdom that it sort of begins to turn in a different direction. Art, inscriptions, sculptures, they start depicting more everyday life, the more human aspect of the world around them. Sort of akin to what art began to take the form of during the Renaissance in Europe. Moreover, we also see the development of philosophy among ancient Egyptian culture. That's right, the Greeks may not have been the first to question the world around them at large. For instance, the lay of the harper and the disputes between a man and his bar begin to actively question whether there is life after death. So when you hear somebody say that we've been asking these kinds of questions since civilization began, then there are in fact some grains of truth in the mix. And these kinds of works by the ancient Egyptians just go to prove that. So without further ado, Let's move on to the reign of an individual who is suggested to be perhaps the greatest ruler of Egypt under the Middle Kingdom, Senusret III. Now, Senusret III's reign is known most notably for his military campaigns. For instance, he is thought to have led campaigns against Nubia to the south of Egypt and expanded Egypt's borders in that general direction. Moreover, he is also thought to have led expeditions into the Levant and Palestine. With these military campaigns, it's no wonder then that Senusret III's campaigns and his biography is theorised to be the basis for the Egyptian king of Greek myth Sesostris, who, according to Herodotus, is believed to have colonised parts of Europe. Although, as we've learn, Herodotus tends to jump into the more fantastical side of things, sort of like Sima Qian. So we can't really draw any factual basis from this, unfortunately, but still, the fact that Senusret III's legacy inspired writings such as this is just incredible, meaning that some aspects of Greek culture may have been inspired by the Egyptians who came before them. The reign of Senusret III is also believed to have been a time of great wealth and prosperity for Egypt, as the expeditions and campaigns into Nubia and Palestine were said to have bolstered trade with those regions. But unfortunately, with Egypt now being more secure than ever, you may think that a good thing, but it's been suggested that this increased security also led to a great fear of the loss of what Egypt had already achieved. For example, the Ipua papyrus tends to build on that fear of loss and generally creates an atmosphere of the sense of great loss from the fall of a golden age, meaning that around this time, the Egyptians perhaps got a little bit skittish and wary of the fact that even though they were secure in their golden age, they had the foresight to see that at any moment it could all come crashing down. And that is where we approach the end of the Middle Kingdom of Egypt. The 13th royal dynasty of Egypt is said to have begun with Sobekhotep I, and although his reign inherited much of the wealth and prosperity of the 12th dynasty before him, many of the 13th dynasty rulers are said to have been weak in character, and with this, separate political entities began to spring up 
all over Egypt. The most prominent of these would become the Hyksos. Hyksos meaning foreign occupiers, and these occupiers, as they are called by the Egyptians themselves, were said to have slowly increased in their political power until eventually the 13th dynasty was dissolved and Egypt again splintered into Upper and Lower Egypt once more, with Lower Egypt being led mostly by the Hyksos and Upper Egypt being led mostly by the original Egyptians themselves. Where the Hyksos came from exactly, we can't be sure but modern theory suggests that they came from regions in the Levant and Syria, and it has been suggested that the Hyksos may be the historical basis for the peoples who fled Egypt as written in the Book of Exodus. So there you have it, the story of the first intermediary period and how Egypt truly came to blossom under the Middle Kingdom and we begin to see Egypt take its more recognisable form as we see it today. So if you enjoyed the video and you're enjoying this series so far, make sure to leave a like and perhaps comment on what you enjoyed. Not to mention, make sure that you are subscribed so that then you don't miss out on future uploads concerning Ancient Egypt. For now though, join me next time as we go into the second intermediary period of Egypt and we begin to look at Egypt's more recognisable form under the New Kingdom and how Egypt was once again proved that it could bounce back from collapse. Although you have to remember, not even something as resilient as ancient Egypt can continue bouncing back forever. I'm Lewis of The Grand Portfolio and thank you for watching.